my name is Dr. John Sapola, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about the 2017 KMEA Allstate clarinet solo, the fast one. So the first figure is actually a sort of written out ornament. And what I would encourage you all to do when you're learning this is to practice very slowly with a metronome. So let me give you an example. If we start out with the metronome somewhere around well, actually, starting it as slowly as you possibly can is really the, the best advice. So say if I started around 60 and I put on some eighth notes, one and two and three and four, this might even be actually too fast for us, so you can even split that in half. Let me play in the first measure just the eighth notes so you'll feel what the tempo is like. So the six notes uh, that we have, the six tuplet, should be three on the downbeat, three on the upbeat. Triple it, triple it, two and three and triple it, triple it. And I use my right-handed back C sharp. So if you're going from D to E and back to D and then using your left hand C sharp, you may have a chance of missing a little bit and getting a little extra note in between. So I would recommend using your right hand fingers. The same thing on measure two, the low F sharp, I would put a low F sharp down here on the right side. And then, just as a little bit of an aside on music theory, what he's doing here, you're in the key of G major and then he's playing a 5-7 chord, and so in measure three, he's arpeggiating that 5-7 chord from your beat two. And in measure four, he... Uh, did I say that correctly? Measure three into measure four. So you're playing a five chord into the one chord. The reason that's important to know is that you're not, you know that you're not playing random notes. Uh, so um, in, in the second line, in measure one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we have those dotted sixteenths and thirty second notes. And at that fast tempo, 112, that might be a little bit challenging to make it very, very snappy and distinctive, aside from them sounding like just straight 16th notes. So what I would encourage you to do is just practice them with a metronome. This metronome is on eighth notes. So... And actually, you really should be thinking every time you have a dotted note, like a dotted 16th and a dotted eighth and a 16th, or in this case, dotted 16th and 30 seconds, you should be dividing that dotted note into three separate segments. I'm really thinking that all the time. Now something else that's going to help in this particular phrase, and it may be a little difficult in the beginning to get it, but it, it will help later with the rhythm, is tonguing in the right place, putting your articulation in the correct place. So in those beats three and four in that bar, make sure that you, you articulate exactly as marked. Um, let's talk about articulation just for a second. So when we articulate on the clarinet, you're using essentially the tip of the tongue, which is about where the taste buds kind of start just above that portion. And we articulate right just below the, where the reed, uh, the end of the reed. We put our tongue on the reed, as if we're saying and then what we do is we put our tongue in the reed to close the air off so the tongue the reed won't vibrate we blow the air we release the tongue very gently and a sound produces and then we gently put the tongue back Let's see if we can find some more challenges. Okay, in line four, where we have that little sideways S, that's called a turn. And it's an ornament, just like in the very first measure, it's a written out ornament. Here in this case, they want you to play an A to a B, and then back to your A, and that little sharp below the sideways S, which is a turn or a grappetto, uh, is a G sharp. So what we should be doing is, since it's very fast, I'm gonna hit just the top I'm going to finger my A like this, 
and hit my top right side key here with kind of this about where the knuckle meets the finger. And again, we come back to hand position that if your hand is a little bit in a diagonal position like this, you're going to have access to hit that key. If your hand is like this, you're going to have a lot of movement. You're going to even have to move your wrist and arm. We try to avoid some of that. So. And again, I'm hitting my right hand at C sharp. And we're trying to not emphasize it too much. Don't accent it. It should just be part of the phrase flowing through. And when they call it, refer to these kinds of figures as ornaments, really they are. They're ornamenting the music. That happens twice and uh, in, in that where it starts in the low C sharp and a couple bars later where it starts in the low D. Now, in my particular edition, the tide marking is a little bit unclear. And so in my per particular edition, the low C sharp has a dot over it, but the D a couple of bars later does not have a dot. But I am going to really tongue both of those similarly. Uh, let's talk about tonguing again when we have the high D major scale. And then it resolves to an E, actually kind of to E minor. Um, we want to basically practice tonguing very, very lightly. So this is a great opportunity to tongue in what we call the clarion register which is anything from B natural here up to high C. Those notes in that particular register of the clarinet require some extra practice in your articulation. So this is a great opportunity for that. And maybe a way to do it would be to take one note at a time and just practice slow repeated notes. I just played a little different scale. Let's play the D scale. to you all. High D is fingered like this. Okay, two, three, one, and the right hand pinky. C sharp though has no pinky in the right hand and you want to make sure that you really do get that pinky off that key. Don't sort of fake it and just leave the key down because you'll develop a really uh, not a, a good efficient habit in your fingers. The hands can learn to get that, that pinky on and off this key if you work at it. Uh, okay, at the end we have a little figure that's in thirds, which means we sort of play a scale, but we skip every other note. And this is going to be one instances where, one instance rather, where I might, let's see. So what I'm going to do is, uh, uh, let me back up a step. Um, let's take these in groups of twos. So when you practice these, And again, isolate these little segments so that you are practicing with that pinky. When you can get a group of two really, really smoothly, maybe add a second group of two. Etc. And then you can add a third group of two. Another way to practice it is to just start on one group and especially start in the high register because in the high register we have a little bit of a different voicing in our uh, embouchure and our air uh, placement. So this gives us just extra practice to familiarize ourselves with these notes and fingerings. how I'm sort of rocking with this. Not too much rocking really with the arm or anything, but I just want to make sure that my pinky is definitely hitting C sharp, no pinky, D, uh, E, high E, yes pinky. And just to confirm, this is my high E fingering. So work these very, very slowly. When you're practicing this particular piece, you want to really focus in on that, that particular passage because you can play this whole piece really fantastically and then get to that section and maybe make some mistakes in that high register. So if you put extra, extra time into that one particular section, you should actually find it more reliably under your fingers when you get to it in the performance. At the end, we have what we call a diminished seventh arpeggio, and I just want to confirm that this is a high F 
thing, right? So we've got three ledger lines uh, at the second to last measure, like this. And then we're going to play F to D to G to B to G sharp. And just make sure after your D that you get your finger off. If you hold your E out nice and long, um, you would probably keep a good voicing in your in your uh, embouchure and in your in your oral cavity to be able to get that F to articulate. And so what I would possibly I'll give you two options: take that E and crescendo on it and play directly to the F like that, or take a breath and as long as everything is the position of your tongue is kind of high like this, you're going to find you can articulate that F. And I sort of kept my E there at one dynamic and maybe even pulled it back a little bit. So again, um, you're trying to strive to play musically and, and whatever you can do to do that, uh, oftentimes tapering the ends of phrases, considering your dynamics, considering the uh, the quality of your articulation, not just that you're actually tonguing notes, but are you uh, hitting the notes a little bit harder or lighter, uh, separating them more or a little bit less. All of those things are under the category of phrasing. So once you're able to practice this very, very slowly and get it all under your fingers, the next part, uh, and actually while you're doing that, you're thinking hopefully about phrasing, that the, the overall performance that you're trying to present will give some musical ideas about where you're headed and uh, create some excitement for the listener. I would encourage you to, uh, number one, always do a short warm-up before you practice, um, some long tones, look at a tuner, and then you use some sort of audible tuner. Second, practice scales, and, and at minimum, practice the scale that the piece is in, uh, and practice the scale slurred and articulated. And then always use a metronome while you're practicing because it will give you a chance to, number one, keep yourself steady with the pulse, number two, to track what kind of progress you're making, um, and number three, it gives us some goals to strive for. Use, work with a metronome sometimes can be deceiving. People can sometimes think that I have to strive for a specific tempo, and if I don't do that, I'm, I'm sort of a failure. I won't get it. But really what you should be striving for is the maximum tempo in this piece that you can achieve with complete clarity of all the notes. So if you're finding that you're able to play this at, say, maybe quarter note equals 70 or quarter note equals 80, and you play it very, very musically, and including that part with the thirds in the upper register, and that sounds really fantastic, that would be much more pleasant for a judge to listen to than to hear it at, say, 110 or 112, but with a few mistakes. So try to avoid all the mistakes that you possibly can avoid. Minimize that by adjusting your tempo carefully. The last thing to think about today that I can give you in a short lesson would be dynamics. There are not many dynamics marked in this particular piece. Uh, in fact, the only thing that would indicate a dynamic is just accents. So again, this leaves the freedom to you, the performer, to decide what to do. A common approach can be that when a line is going up, a crescendo is done, and when a line is moving down, a day crescendo is done. Oftentimes, though, I find that the opposite can be just as effective. And what I did in that case is I tried to lead my dynamic down to the low F sharp, and I put a little bit of a tenuto in the low F sharp with a sort of, not a, really an accent, but a lengthening. So if you can consider those kinds of markings, uh, again, to try to think of the groups of notes as a, as a phrase, dynamics and uh, articulation all being considered together, you'll think more and more like a musical sentence rather than playing things very strictly. I hope that helps and please leave some comments below and I wish you all the best.